Any good business should always look to evolve. Society evolves, social media evolves, yeah. And you have to be on top of it to ensure that we can really try and stay on top of what we're doing and try and be market leaders or at least up there. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd come from a darts background, not a business background. And it was the same for franchising. I think when you start, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and I really did in the early days that I must know everything, okay. that I must be the master of everything. And if I'm not, then I can't be an entrepreneur. I can't be a business owner. Whereas that is such a destructive mindset or terrible narrative to have. And I, I had to learn that along the years. So you've got to bring in the experts. You've got to bring in people that do know these things and do it day in and day out. Anne-Marie, thank you very much for being here. Hi. And I'm really excited to talk to you because I have been able to interview quite a few entrepreneurs through this podcast journey. But I've never actually been able to speak to anybody who's set up franchises. Ah. And especially not in the way that you've done. The first taste that would be great to start. We just have a bit of an introduction to yourself. Cool. Well, yeah, I'm Anne-Marie Martin, founder and franchisor of Diddy Dance. So back in 2003... I started up Diddy Dance, which is toddler dance classes. We do parties, uh, going to early year settings, and also um, we develop an Ascend program as well. So, yeah, lots of different things. All right, in saying that as of this month, you are 19 years in business. Yes, that feels like a long time ago. It makes me feel really old as well. But, yeah. I think something that I found really interesting was that you originally didn't even come from a business background. So you were working as a dancer. So yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, so I danced all my life from the age of three uh, in Derby. So that's where I'm from. So not far from you. Yeah. And um, so I went to a local dance school and really enjoyed it, but found I was quite talented at it. So carried that on after my GCSEs went on to A-level dance. And then I decided to pursue it as a degree as well. So I left the Northern School of Contemporary Dance with a first class degree um, in 1997 and then was lucky enough to perform all over the world. I was in a contemporary dance company for just over a year at the Royal Opera House and really enjoyed performing. But I think from quite an early age as well, I'd always enjoyed the teaching side. Okay. So as part of my dissertation, it was about dance movement therapy and dance in special educational needs. And so I was always interested in dance being for everyone, dance being inclusive and um, and teaching. But I think when you're focusing on your performance career, mm -hmm. which can be quite sporadic, mm -hmm. um, trying to commit to lots of regular teaching, I always believed that children need that um, regularity of the, the same teacher. So it was hard to try and balance regular teaching work along with still wanting to audition and potentially travel all over. So I think it was around 2001 where I'd done some amazing jobs, been on the Brit Awards, Top of the Pops, that's how old it is. Um, and, and then decided, okay, I think time to retire from the performing is now and let's focus on, uh, on just teaching. But I, even then I found myself now in London traveling all over London, and that was before the Elizabeth line, and then all over London, teaching various evenings. I think I used to do Thursday evenings in Ealing, and I'd be North London, Central London, all over, and it was quite exhausting. Yeah. And it's been quite antisocial hours. Now, at this point, I hadn't met my partner, um, but I just felt I was running around all the time. So then I took on a job uh, in events management and promotion. So I worked for a promotions agency, booking lots of performers who were then doing hospitality and promotions work and discovered that an office job wasn't quite suited for me either. For her. And then, so stopped that and found I was still doing a lot of weekend and evening work, but my Monday to Friday days were quite empty. Then I started working for... Um, these baby and toddler classes. It was like a plane set up an American company. And that was in Islington. Mm -hmm. And that was giving me work Monday to Friday, but it was there. So this had come to about 2003 where 
all the grown-ups coming to these baby and toddler classes were going, oh, we've been looking for dance classes. And, you know, the local dance schools do their pre-primary classes, but it's drop-off, it's quite formal. Right. And, you know, I just feel they're a little bit young. They've been coming out saying, I don't want to do dancing. You're a dancer. Why don't you start something? And I was really like, under fives? Are you sure what we can do here? Yeah. But that drive was then saying, oh, they've come out saying, I don't want to do dancing. And that was my sort of red rag to think, right, we can't have a little child's first experience of a dance class being something too formal for their age. Yeah. So, yeah, they literally booked me a hall, told me to turn up and 19 years ago, figured that out and then developed it uh, to where it is today. So, taking you back to that, what was your first dance class like? Bearing in mind that this was obviously a group of students, you never really taught that age group before, hadn't you? Well, I think it was lots of them that I was used to in the play classes. So there was a familiarity there and the parents and grown-ups there were, had a, you know, a relaxed understanding. Yeah. I'd figured out from the play classes that repetition was key. Things like the hello song and things like the goodbye song. And things that were repeated every, every week. Really tiny ones were remembering these things. So I was like, okay, repetition's key. Let's think about something catchy that I can do. But we didn't have our own original music then. The first class was very much tweenies, S Club 7. So I'd got my PPL license. I was like, okay, let's figure this out. And also, I think we had some of our props back then. It's my old age memory trying to take me back 19 years. <laughs> um, it felt good. Everyone was really supportive and positive. I'm sure it must have been very chaotic. Um, I'm sure I may have felt completely out of my debt. But I think because they were so supportive, they were really encouraging of me. And so over the weeks, I was developing it. And just, I think, through working with them through the play classes, I understood just how much energy and how much fun I needed to make it mm -hmm. and very quickly. I think we were thinking about only a matter of within six months, I'd gone from that one class a week to five, six. Eventually, I had seven classes in just that one venue a week. Oh, wow. All fully booked. But again, this was 19 years ago where there just weren't many mm -hmm. play or toddler classes out there. So there wasn't really mass competition. Okay. Um, so I think I tapped into a, a market at the right time, actually. At what point did you realise, okay, I'm onto something here? Well... I think I'd always, since an early age, thought about, I found some old sketches ages ago of AM's dance schools and I'd traced all these point shoes and things. So I think I'd always thought about running my own dance school. But I think I'd thought of it in the traditional sense of I will, you know, I trained in IDTA. I thought, right, I would do all of those teaching and I would run a syllabus school with exams and shows and and they're all ages. I'm guessing like particular styles of dance as well. Yeah. And I thought that would be the route. But falling into the preschool market, one, I realised that, wow, this age group are hilarious. They are little sponges who are so rewarding to work with because you see all of their firsts. You see them come out of their shell. That innocence. I found that I loved that age group okay. and realised that that is actually where the, my passion lay and so I realized right I think this could be something to explore further and then went down the route of taking on some teachers to see if the concept I had built so I'd started exploring uh, lots of different elements and the flow of the class and so I took on teachers go right if I removed myself as the passionate one who is all, always going to deliver them to yeah. what I feel is the top standard if I can train teachers now will it still be as popular? So I trained up some teachers and it seemed to still go well. And then I was actually living in, that was in Islington, I was living in South East London. So I thought, let me test it closer to where I live. So I then tested around East and South East London with myself and teachers and thought, okay, that's working as well. Is this a fluke? I don't know. But it was then about three years later I then thought, okay, I think I'm really on to something now. Okay. I'd heard of 
licensing and franchising. And I thought, right, let's look at franchising and try and grow the business. I'd imagine that at that point, Dealey Downs was you effectively taking on extra staff. Did you have a set criteria in mind about what they needed to bring to the class or was it just a bit of trial and error? Trial and error, definitely. So in my head, even though for this age group, it wasn't about, there's no technique, there's no alignment. We don't have to be a qualified dance teacher. We're not teaching a set syllabus, as it were. I always still thought, right, let me make sure I'm taking on qualified dance teachers with years of experience. But actually what I was finding is that their experience was very much in the formal setting. Right. And so their adaptability to be able to engage with toddlers wasn't necessarily the right fit. So it was definitely a lot of trial and error of going, oh, no, 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 that feels really formal. No, that's complete opposite of what I'm trying to achieve here in the ethos we're going down. And so I very soon found that finding the right personality was more suitable than what experience or dark qualifications they have. And that still runs to this day, even for the franchisees. You've got to be able to engage this age group than necessarily be the best dancer out there. I remember from when I was doing all the dance when I was younger, the amount of competition there was for dance schools. And I know you said that when you started, it was still quite an untapped sort of area. But as you were growing, especially when you started franchising, you must have noticed that competition was spiking up in different areas. I think, again, because it was the preschool market, there weren't many dance schools that were doing the younger ones, most of them started from around four. But the ones that did, again, as I said, it was quite a formal setting, right. drop off. So there weren't really any parent toddler classes and it really was a niche in the market, I felt. But I think nowadays there are so many yeah. toddler activities out there. Um, it is quite a saturated market in some places and I do... I give advice to other activity providers who are thinking of starting up or thinking of franchising. And I do say to them, really hone in on what your USPs are. Okay. Because it is so heavily saturated now. We still are the only preschool dance program to explore lots of different dance styles. And all of the sessions, we've worked with child psychologists, early years movement specialists. We've ensured that we've done lots of training on uh, actually our eight sensors, which are also vestibular, proprioceptive and interoception sensors, so that we can really be the best or the most knowledgeable in what we do specifically for this age group. So we try and really push that. Let's talk about franchising. What was it like when you decided to get into franchising? Were you experiencing any nerves or was it just something you wanted to do? I knew it was something I wanted to do. I'd looked at the options of licensing and, and franchising. Um, but for me, I think I put so much passion into building the sessions the way they were. I was happy with the flow. I, we'd started creating all our own original music that I felt I wanted the ethos and the brand to have consistency wherever it ran. So yeah, somebody could go to Diddy Dance in Manchester and Diddy Dance in London and get the same feel and, and same structure. So I decided franchising was the route. Suppose even like starting the business, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd come from a dance background, not a business background. And it was the same for franchising. And so I was like, where do I start? And I think because there weren't many children's activity franchises out there either, I didn't know who to go to and, and a franchise consultant. I knew I needed the experts in because I wanted to do it correctly to make sure all the legals were in place. But it took me a while to find a consultant who had worked with any kids activity. And so finally I found one and, and they had worked very heavily with the big brand that was Stagecoach. So I was like, great. And I used to teach for Stagecoach for many, many years. And I thought, okay, they understand our sector. So that was great. And they took me through the whole process brilliantly. I didn't feel... Because again, franchising at the time was was quite a male-dominated industry. Lots of franchise brands uh, were male-run. And so my franchise consultant and all of his team were males. But they made me feel really relaxed, definitely included, and took me through the whole process. 
uh, step by step with templates and guidance and so that I could really understand what I was doing as well rather than then go, right, we'll write that up for you. No, we'll give you the guide and then you have to put yourself in here so that you fully understand it when you then take it to franchisees. So I can't be more thankful for them. And just little things like, so when the classes first started, they were called Funky Feet. Okay. (laughs) And I'd got little t-shirts made up and, um, you know, I'd done some clip art work of two feet um, with just black writing onto these t-shirts. I was like, great. And I had heard, well, I need to trademark it. So I'd gone to uh, the trademark register and registered it and spent a lot of money. And then when we came to franchise, and this is a massive tip I give to anybody starting their own business, especially if you want to scale it, is just a simple Google search before you buy a trademark. Because if you've checked the trademark register and it doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that somebody isn't already using that name. So when you buy your trademark, if somebody can prove that they've already been operating under that name, Funky Feet, before you start... It's really, really hard to stop them using that name. Almost impossible. Oh, why? Right. So I bought this trademark and then we looked to franchise and um, and he was like, right, okay, let's do a quick Google search on, on Funky Feet. Make sure it's exclusive in the category and classification of the trademark you want. And uh, hundreds, hundreds of them out there. Oh, wow. I was the UK. Uh, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, what do I do then? I can't franchise. That's it. I'm done. And I had this big meltdown of that's it I can't franchise I can't we can't grow this and he went just need to change the name oh okay yeah okay and um it was as simple as that it was right okay I like alliteration to be fair funky feet doesn't really do what it says on the tin there are shoe companies out there footwear uh specialists and then I was like okay so they dance they're little they're diddy diddy dance and it was literally as quick as that, went straight onto the trademark register, straight onto Google, nothing out there under Diddy Dance, bought the trademark straight away and went from there. And actually down the line, I was able to sell my Funky Feet trademark to somebody else. So it wasn't a complete loss of money. But nowadays, as a trademark owner, lots of people run little classes in their dance schools or all over and they call it diddy dance or diddy dancers and um and so really do check the name that you want to run anything pass the trademark register first on the gov website because it's so horrible as well being the big bad guy going i'm really sorry but you can't use that name because it's our trade name yeah what do you mean i spent hundreds on t-shirts and the website and it's like i'm really sorry but we've we franchised and so that would cause confusion to our customers. Um, so yeah, big tip, make sure you always check the trademark register first. When it comes to businesses today, social media is used a lot in terms of marketing. Back when you started, there was no social media. So tell us some of the marketing techniques you used and how relevant you think they would be today. Um, yeah, there was nothing. I think somebody did a pre- presentation the other day Facebook, I didn't, I think didn't even start till 2004. And see, there was literally nothing. Yeah. So I was there on my printer with my black and white flyers that I would guillotine off and hand out. I had a good customer base in the play classes I was running. And, you know, I didn't want to encroach on, on anyone, but naturally people were, were asking, which was great. Lots of word of mouth lots of flyering and lots of posters everywhere. And so leading up to the pandemic, I think when social media came about, everybody was like, great. And that is where everybody went. And it was like, right, make sure you're utilizing the tools and we give social media training to all the franchisees. But it was almost the pandemic and lockdown, everybody did go online, but everybody went online. So your ability to stand out through social media became less. It became a lot more about paid advertising. The platforms wanted you to do that. Yeah. So it was harder to get that organic reach. And so actually those methods, 
that I first started with 19 years ago, I tell the franchisees to go back to those now. I'm like, you can't beat face-to-face. You can't beat wandering around, make sure you've got business cards or flyers in your bag. You're wandering around the park, posters, into places where parents would hang out, or the coffee shops. And also going back to, I used to do lots of taster sessions in the local toddler groups or church groups, many places where, again, parents would come for coffee mornings or stay in plays. And that is even more relevant now because I do feel we are quite saturated with being sold to online that you can't be doing a little 20 minute taster in front of tens of parents and then seeing exactly what you do, seeing how much their children love it. And then they're like, brilliant, I'm sold because the children love it. So I do think we've almost gone full circle into just go back to that human touch, humanize things and face to face and talk to people. Because I think unless you really stand out with your social media content nowadays, you can get a bit lost in it. So you've basically gone back to basics. And I guess, you know, with your business as well, it is a community-based business. It's not like you're selling products online. No. So getting in with the community is probably always going to be something that's really beneficial for your business. Definitely. And I don't say to all the franchisees, not about one or the other. I do everything. You definitely need to be using social media. But I think what we've been working on a lot lately is a lot more engaging video content and exploring those other platforms that um, our parents are on, such as TikTok and, you know, the younger platforms. Um, I'm not my own target market anymore. At at 47 years old with a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old, I'm not looking for type of classes. So potentially parents who are in their 20s, early 30s, are. And so if I was looking at a platform for myself, oh, can't be doing that TikTok thing. And that's <laughs> it. Um, forget that, because that is where the younger parents that are hanging out, that win have uh, toddlers. So we explore lots of different platforms, but I think that is where your video content is so crucial now. We have got to hook people in very quickly. And that is where I think a service-based business, especially one that is so energetic, um, ribbons and hula hoops, you can get that across through video content really well. And it makes for very engaging and entertaining watching as well. I'm curious about one thing, just through podcasting, I've met a few entrepreneurs who also came from dancing backgrounds. Do you think there's anything from being a dancer and going through the dancing world that prepares you for business? Absolutely. And I give this, uh, I do talks into sort of secondary schools and colleges as well. And I talk about my journey. We know how to hustle because we have grown up going to audition after casting, after audition, after entering a room and before you've even got to dark, go, no, 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 no. So we have built up that resilience, that drive to take all the knockbacks. So I just think we get into this mindset of, um, I was interviewing a potential franchisee the other day and she said the same. She was just like, you know, as a dancer, you're just, you're driven. You don't want to say no to things. You always see things as an opportunity. So we definitely think uh, being a dancer, if you have gone through many auditions, many castings, and you've gone, right, today I need to be there and there and there and chasing this and following this up. Yeah. And being really proactive about chasing up your agent or the dance agency that you're with. I just think it gives you that right drive and that right mindset to push yourself and and be really driven. So one thing that we like to talk a lot about on this podcast is about things that we don't necessarily know about and being quite proud of that. I know you've been in business now for 19 years, so it's probably a lot you've learned along the way. (laughs) Is there anything that you've learned that's really key and vital that you had no idea about when you started your business that you do know now? Pretty much everything. Coming from a dance background was great and being used to being self-employed and doing your tax return and, um, I mean, figures is definitely not a strength of mine. Um, so there was an element of knowing about that, but I think things like the trade marking, things like legal compliance and documentation, all those sort of things. I think when you start, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and I really did in the early days that I must know everything. 
okay. that I must be the master of everything. And if I'm not, then I can't be an entrepreneur. I can't be a business owner. Whereas that is such a destructive mindset or terrible narrative to have. And I, I had to learn that along the years. So you've got to bring in the experts. You've got to bring in people that do know these things and do it day in and day out. I talk about, I'm no good at finances and figures um, and I have no desire to be. So that is where I bring in somebody who loves accounting and loves bookkeeping to do that because they can get that done so much more efficiently than me. So yes, I think you should have an awareness of everything in your business, but you don't need to be the drilled down master of everything. Mm -hmm. Just be able to oversee and I've done lots of sort of management and leadership courses so that I can try and be as understanding as possible and try and lead people um, with inspiration or, or drive, but not micromanage. Yeah. So I think there's a lot to learn about yourself personally as well and whether you are a good leader and you can be a good franchisor because that's sort of taking leadership onto a whole nother level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's lots of learning and continuous learning, um, but I think there's lots of self-discovery that you have to do along the way. That was actually one thing I wanted to ask you about leadership because even though dancing is such a group activity, it's also very solo as well when you're going through competitions. Was there any other way that you were practicing your leadership skills? I think you definitely have that drive as a performer, you have a level of confidence that when you do get all the knock knockbacks, you are, no, I can still do this. Yeah. So that definitely helps in leadership because when you have those days of, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, this is terrible. Yeah. No, I can do this. <laughs> Let's think of an audition. I can do this. I can get through this. You are used to competition, but you're used to celebrating others' achievements as well. So you know, you very often were auditioning against your friend. And if you didn't get the role, but your friend did, of course, you're going to feel gutted, but you are genuinely going to be happy for them as well. So I think it gets you used to celebrating others, which as a franchise are always so important. Um, celebrate their wins, celebrate their successes, even if they're not your own. I think the other big point is as well, when you are learning about yourself, is accepting that you don't have to have all the answers. That was a big thing for me yeah. in lockdown. So obviously we're thrown into a pandemic that nobody's ever experienced before. Definitely. And you've got this network that you are responsible for and they are coming to you for the art. How long is this going to last? When can we reopen? What should we do classes online? What are we going to do? Yeah. And when you're a franchisor where people are buying into your network, then you are, I must know all the answers because otherwise why would they have bought into my network? And if I don't have all the answers, then I'm going to be seen as a failure and um, they're all going to want to leave. So I've always had that pressure on myself as well. But what the pandemic taught me was, I don't have to have all the answers because I don't actually know them. And again, the more honest you can be with yourself, but also the minute you can be honest with others, there's almost this, ah, this relief away of the shop. Ah, and you know, my line was always, I don't have a hotline to Bojo. I, I don't, I can't call him up and check. So I know as much as you know, and we will get through this together. And I think that's another big strength of franchise here. Um, it is a two way street. They are business owners. Yes, you've given them all the training, all the ongoing guidance and support but you are there to listen to them as, as well. We're all equals in that journey and we all develop things together. So, I mean, I did volunteer for lots of associations to figure out what the guidance was for us in preschool, out of school guidance, early years guidance, but that was mainly about childcare and then performing arts guidance. Trying to bring all of that together was essential for me as a franchisor with lots of other franchisors and kids activity providers so that gave me confidence but also listening to the franchisees and then going well actually I think I've read that slightly differently and um, being open and adaptable to go oh yeah I think you might be right so there's lots of personal learning to do but definitely being able to be open and honest I think 
makes you a better leader. In the spirit of not having all the answers, is there anything that you are working on now for your future business? Absolutely. And I think any good business should always look to evolve. Society evolves, social media evolves, yeah. And you have to be on top of it to ensure that we can really try and stay on top of what we're doing and try and be market leaders or at least up there. So I'm always learning, always going to various different learning events, online courses. And so right now, we really want Diddy Dance to be as inclusive as possible. So inclusivity for our regular crafters with the franchisees and teachers learning Makaton. Um, we do lots of autism awareness courses, just did another one on Saturday. And so I think for me, my next passion is really about inclusive dance. The last few years, you've grown your TikTok account. Tell us a little bit about how you started on TikTok. So I came about uh, on TikTok. So in 2020, when lockdown happened, again, story of my business life, a franchise consultant said, Anne-Marie, I think, you know, TikTok's going to be great for Diddy Dance. Everybody's going on there right now. They're all sat at home and such an entertaining platform. You know, you're just following people who are really funny or everybody's trying to do the latest dance. Yeah, and get themselves entertained. And um, you should get on there. I was just like, oh, I don't know if I have the capacity to learn a whole new platform. And he was like, well, if you don't have the capacity when we're all shut down at home, when are you? Went, good point. Okay, leave it with me. Let me do it. So June 2020, started our TikTok platform. One, I really enjoy it still. So for me, I find it enjoyable creating content on there, which I think can be half the battle. Um, but I love the discoverability of it as a platform. Now, I appreciate that joining in 2020, there was you were able to grow quite quickly yeah. Yeah. because so many people were on it all the time. However, it is quite an addictive platform. So people are still on it, just maybe not as much now because they have to actually go back to work. Yeah. Um, but I just think for us as a business, it's our biggest platform. We are now, I've done lots of courses. I've been involved in the TikTok Academy. And also I've done a TikTok business account program as well to try and see how we can utilize it really well. And so some of the paid opportunities you can do on there are great, but also some of the functionality now you can do is is really good on there as a platform. Um, so I think the demographic is perfect for us. Our discoverability is brilliant on there. And I think like any social media platform, yes, we have to take it as brand awareness. Yeah. Not everybody can use a social media platform and expect direct uh, leads on there. But I just think, for that discoverability and getting more eyes on your business, it can be such a huge platform. We are 61,000 followers on TikTok compared to, I think, Facebook. It's been going a long time, so we're in the tens of thousands, but nowhere near that. Instagram, we were at two, 3,000. So I think it's a brilliant platform, actually, and I advocate for it all the time because it's a very real audience. They want to see behind the scenes. They want to get to know you yeah. As a business owner or get to know the, the business, you can create content that isn't salesy and you can create it through humor and yeah. entertainment and therefore people resonate with that better. If you can make them laugh, they're going to engage with you. With your TikTok, you don't just focus on the dance that you're always putting yourself out there as well. What's that experience been like for you? People buy from people. So I could have set it up very much as a, a brand account and that is what our other Instagram page is but I think definitely for TikTok people want to see people they tend to engage more with faces and, yeah. and people on there they feel there's a human behind it and so I think yes you're always putting yourself out there a little bit more but coming from a performing background being comfortable in front of the camera and being used to that it's find it quite easy creating content I like to mix it up because I like people to get a full knowledge of what the business is about the fact that not only do we deliver classes and, and parties and going to nurseries but also it's a franchise opportunity yeah yeah and so I think if I can 
push myself out there and my personal brand a bit more and try and be the expert in my field that that gives more credibility to the brand yeah and people can hopefully relate to me on a personal level as well and feel your classic they get to know me they get to like me and hopefully then they get to trust me and trust the brand as well so yeah I don't mind putting myself out there more so for people who want to know where to find you and where they can learn about the dance uh, can you tell us about your socials of course so we are on I think nearly every platform. And if you look up Diddy Dance, D I D D I, DiddyDance.com for the website, Diddy Dance Crew for Instagram, uh, Diddy Dance. There were also lots of local pages on all of our Facebook and Instagram. We are original Diddy Dancer on TikTok and YouTube Diddy Dance as well. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your story with us. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you so much.